Welcome to the Nutramedical Report live for the our first year anniversary, the day after the first year anniversary of Fukushima. And we have a special with Chris Harris, our nuclear safety expert. Uh, Chris, we're posting up today a very important document uh, that we didn't release last week on Thursday. Uh, it's the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist 2012, a very frank analysis of the disaster of Fukushima and why it was such a big disaster. That in fact, not only the reactor number one was damaged before the tsunami struck, but also the cooling pool, uh, pools of these reactors, plus uh, the other reactors across northern uh, Japan were just were damaged significantly. 400 tons of water was released uh, at a nuclear plant on the other side of Honshu. So uh, let's go through this paper analysis, which I'm posting up a PDF copy of this 14-page PDF for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Uh, start off with the main bullet points as to what you want to talk about today, because people need to understand that if we deal with this in an honest, forthright fashion, whether it's here or nuclear reactors in America, where 75% are near we'll call fight line danger, danger zones. Now, this obviously wasn't the case 40 or 50 years ago when they put these reactors in, but they need to actually put the money and time and safety experts and backup power. Otherwise, we're going to have American Fukushimas. And we had uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Pentanella on a, a few uh, weeks ago talking about her book about the American Fukushima, and it's coming. All we need is an extreme weather event, a major power shutdown, a tsunami, or a major quake along the San Andreas Fault, uh, or along the fault lines at the New Madrid fault system in the southeast United States, and we're going to have an American Fukushima. We already have, however, the situation in Japan that's making the northern part of the island a radioactive dead zone, and the to radiation in northern Tokyo now, with them burning over 200 million tons in high-temperature furnaces in Tokyo and distributing the trash all over Japan, also selling the seafood and other material all over Japan, and say it's patriotic to eat the food is insane. Um, they're even giving, uh, if you want to call it, tourism promotions to people in other countries like Hong Kong to come visit Fukushima uh, when it's very dangerous and, number, and the exclusion zone hasn't been revised because the radiation level is still 33 times the acceptable level. Uh, let's go through this paper and analysis and w what do we learn from this? Well, first of all, Dr. Bryce, I wanted to thank you for allowing me to come on. I'm, I'm not really, I don't have anything to sell or a, or a website or anything really like that. I do contribute to some as a nuclear expert in uh, with over 30, no, 33 years in the industry. And that includes light being a licensed plant operator at uh, two nuclear power plants. So I had a, uh, and on also other roles, many other, uh, I wore many hats in many of them. So I, when on March 11th last year, when I saw well, really, I looked at on the Drudge Report, and it really it said that there is a huge earthquake, no cooling. And I said, well, what about electricity? I scroll down, they have nothing, no power, no nothing, no, and the roads are knocked out. I said, this plant's in big trouble. Man, I, I don't know what they're going to tell the public, but I was also involved in some other activities for planning for certain types of events that are very similar to this one, and I know that you don't have hours. You really you don't have you don't have that many hours. In fact, in this case, we really didn't look like you had an hour before uh, before core damage started occurring. You know, we, we say we we anticipate uh, four hours uh, of battery life, but if you could really see that, that really didn't even happen because there was such damage to the to the electrical distribution system on some of these some of them, like unit unit one and unit two. Uh, um, later on, Unit 3, that core damage was occurring well ahead of schedule, as, as we would say, because right here in the United States, we're saying we have four hours of battery life, and we can do something and, and get emergency equipment in there, and we can get, uh, we could get uh, some sort of electrical power back again. We can get something going, and we can get an off-site power source again. But the tsunami and the, and the earthquake made that impossible. And it made it impossible in many different reasons. And one of the reasons was that uh, the the actual the actual uh, uh, electrical line towers were knocked down. I mean, they physically were knocked down. And that and one of them I was looking at was uh, one of them was a uh, knocked down by the tsunami itself. When when that happened, there was no, no chance of getting offsite power from that particular circuit. And it turns out that the earthquake in the surrounding areas also knock down power lines everywhere else and, and uh, electrically the Fukushima Daiichi 
uh, nuclear station was an electrical island. It was all by itself. And to make matters worse, the emergency diesel generators, the thing that we rely on in that, re in that respect, were also flooded, submerged, and, and otherwise incapacitated so that yeah. none of the emergency equipment that's installed could actually function. And on right. top of that, too, there was actual there was damage to some of the safety systems. But although there, were, I, there were purposeful that, design faults, too, whether or not it was the connection with the turbine buildings, uh, the trenches that allowed water to seep directly out hundreds of yards only to the, to the, to the water with no seawall or area to contain the water going out. That's why they're talking about uh, literally paving hundreds to thousands of square miles of the ocean floor uh, and in fact before the tsunami reactor number one we know the containment was broken we know that the uh, there was major damage to these cooling pools which actually had were full to the brim some of them with radioactive nuclear material and mox reactor fuel, fuel cooling pool number uh, three and four these reactor pools were filled also with high plutonium uh, grade uh, rods and it was obvious they were reprocessing, so in fact, the Fukushima plant was a nuclear weapons development facility. Uh, and uh, this is one of the secrets that they don't want to get out, that in fact, while the Japanese are pointing fingers at Iran, they in fact were reprocessing plutonium for uh, detonators for nuclear warheads. Well, it's, you know, and that, that part of that, yeah, that emerged later on anyway, because it really... Yeah, but it did not emerge. I'd say it's, it's not like... It's involved uh, it's, in, it's, in producing electrical power using, uh, you know, using uranium and, yeah. and uh, some part of yeah, the... Yeah, uh, they were, they were going to convert them to MOX, which is even more dangerous because they, quantitatively it's around 40,000 times more dangerous than the regular non-MOX reactors. But they were making plutonium detonators, and this isn't conspiracy theory. That's why I want to bring it up, which is uh, interesting because the Japanese, with their uh, missile launching capacities, could really quickly tool over... Uh, to, uh, to to deliver nuclear weapons, and it's not uh, apparent to most people, but Japan is potentially one of the largest nuclear powers on Earth. Uh, yeah, and, and that's why that's why I, I was uh, very happy that you allowed me to tell tell the well tell at least, at least uh, sound the warning, because uh, it was evident to me and other folks that that no, we all have different areas of expertise. We're all we have a strengths, we all have weaknesses, and, and as a team, we uh, we talk to each other and said, "This is this is an event that's that's not going to go well." Exactly. And, I, yeah. and and then all of a sudden, you hear on CNN someone coming on there, and I don't even know what what expert or scientist it was, but it was it's just venting off steam, just like it's supposed to do. It's just like it's. I said, "No, wait a minute. Is that is that the message coming out? That can't be right." And you know, that's what I heard. I said, "No, I got I got to say something because this is not." This is not reality. Reality right. is that there is massive amounts of damage at that plant, and there's no way to control it. All yeah. the controls, because I understand the controls, they're gone. There's nothing left to control the the removal of heat. There's nothing left to even control the criticality, and uh, and there's no there was no containment either. You're right. And, no, the, uh, the other thing that needs to be made uh, clear is that out of 55 reactors before the March 11th uh, disaster one year ago, yesterday. They're down to five reactors, and many of these reactors, they say they took them offline because they were checking for maintenance, but in fact, they found damage in reactors all over Japan, not just the Northern Islands. This is a very large earthquake that struck there. It was a, a 9.3 quake, which is the largest quake in probably 1,500 years in Japan, and that quake generated a tsunami at, at a subduction zone about 125 miles off of Sendai, Japan. The uh, earthquake itself caused a lot of damage. And uh, there are a number of plants that basically they've enumerated major damage to. The post-reactor situation is this is already melt through and melt down. So the coriums are well below the reactor in the water table, generating tritiated, superheated steam, shoving out thousands of te degrees temperature radioisotopes through steam uh, tubes, not only under the ocean, but under land going many kilometers. And uh, probably getting even to the, into the... Japanese Tokyo train system, which is why the radioactivity is spiking so high there in northern Tokyo. Back in a moment.
comments here on page six. Can you go over that? Page six of the document, which we do have the PDF posted up right now. And uh, where do we go in the lines or paragraphs? Which paragraph? Column A or column B? Left hand side, uh, page six of the uh, document, uh, which is about the middle of the page, it starts with one example. One example of the power of this of the Savior. Actually, preceding that, it talks uh, to set that up. It talks about how uh, NISA, which was their uh, industrial and safety, uh, Japan's uh, agency, was unprepared to handle such an event, such as as Fukushima. And you know, we're, we're trying to draw parallels to see how prepared we are here too. Even though you know, yeah. I, I thought that we were uh, we had a lot. To be said for some of our some of our preparations, we're finding that that some of these circle back and feed into our unpreparedness also. But to tell you to tell uh, what what they're talking about in this case was the uh, they we always talk about drilling. We run drills. I mean that's what we do in the industry. We always prepare. We make sure that procedures are up to snuff. We make sure that everybody knows where to go and what to do when they get there. And that's drilling. And that's any emergency preparedness. Uh, organization is supposed to perform those those tasks so that when the time comes, you know what to do and you know how to do it, and then you know, and you also know that the equipment is ready when you need it, and then you also know how to use it. Well, it is likely that Japan was going to get an earthquake, and uh, there was going to be a big uh, earthquake drill. Back in 2007, they hadn't run one like this, this, this uh, magnitude before, and uh, they were going to have a joint drill between several prefectures, and they were going to get the emergency organizations all together and to, uh, you know, make sure that they knew which uh, which page on the hymn book they were going to sing from and, and what the dance was going to look like and all. And, and instead of calling it a, a an earthquake drill, they changed it at the last minute, thinking that earthquake and the public opinion it may it may cause a conflict and it was at that point that uh, they didn't want to cause unnecessary anxiety and misunderstanding so they did not run an earthquake drill instead they ran a something they're calling a heavy snow emergency no no is, no not heavy snow you got to be kidding uh, and, and uh, you know that's something that I'm glad I read this before I came on here. Well, you know what? I didn't know that. You know, we, we've come across a uh, brought out a lot of information. One thing we did talk about is that nothing, it's not all going to come out in in one shot. It's going to be uh, you know dribs and drabs and all. But it was was interesting to see how this uh, the atomic uh, engineer well, this bulletin of the atomic engineers uh, brought this out. And I said, well, you know what? Yeah, I didn't even know that. But how do you like that? What about so the idea of that the wet well? What about the wet well effect? Uh, this is one that you brought out yourself and your team brought the idea that the wet well had some major engineering flaws where they actually did a faux engineering with, and it was a big argument whether or not between the engineer groups whether they should vent off the hydrogen early or not. In fact, this seemed to be one of the most full, important fulcrum factors. One group knew that the uh, faux engineering with very, very weak uh, uh, venting systems couldn't tolerate the high pressures generated in the wet well. And so they were recommending a delay in hydrogen venting, which of course caused a hydrogen explosion that broke the containment in the main area beyond the damage done by the earthquake. And then the other group were suggesting to do it early, when, despite the fact that the engineering was basically not of the right metallurgy, uh, welding techniques, etc., to be able to withstand the high pressures. Can you talk about that for a moment? Because we have similar things going on here in America. I remember a report of a reactor in uh, northern Chicago, and not too, too far from Chicago, where in fact they were kind of brushing uh, one of the some of these steam vent pipes, and I think it was one of these uh, high pressure uh, steam uh, turbines, and in fact the the brush actually broke right through the steam turbine pipe walls, literally brushing it. Okay, uh, yeah, you, that, that was a cooling water piping. A and cooling water pipe, yeah. That, I believe that was the Byron plant. Like, That's like, the Byron plant, yeah. So, and we, in yeah. other words, we have disasters all across the country. If we took independent scientists, it's a similar thing to the FDA where they'll, uh, you know, they, they'll tell us, for example, we have to change our pain reliever cream to, to ache reliever because pain can only be used by drug companies or people have been selling Tylenol. On the other hand, they'll put a GMO food that'll cause you to grow hair on the inside of your mouth or make you go blind or get a purple scrotum. Uh, the same thing is going on with the nuclear industry, where, where I know it's funny, but it's crazy. Uh, if, well, if you're a gerbil, it's not funny, because that's what happens to you. Uh, if you've been experimented on with GM food, but the same thing is going on with nuclear. 
75 percent of these plants they even admit vent off tritium tritium's not good for you it causes a dna intercalations of the dna or replicates uh the fact is that nuclear has to be in our future people say oh we don't want nuclear we don't want nuclear we have to store it forever look if we have proper transport train uh, cars we have proper transport uh, ships if we deal with it safely nuclear is safe uh the fact is it's a zero net in terms of oxygen consumption we're heading into an ice age we're heading into an area of the galaxy that happens every 62 to 65 million years and we're going to get cody jones on to talk about this one of the scientists that presented this on larouche they were on a converging cycle that causes extinction level events and when it does it drops oxygen when the oxygen level was hit by the dinosaurs with these extinction level events it dropped to five percent from thirty percent and that's not good it's already dropped from twenty one to eighteen percent in major cities around the world now and you can't keep killing the oceans polluting like crazy and burning off a carbon it's not just carbon based fuels because they're all abiotic the problem is you consume oxygen and there's a limited capacity to generate oxygen there's virtually unlimited fuel on the earth but there's not unlimited oxygen and whenever you have a carbon based fuel economy it's not the carbon that's the problem the oil gas or whatever it's how much oxygen can your biotic systems regenerate carbon dioxide back into oxygen and if you pollute the oceans if you destroy the biosphere you don't have the capacity to stretch to actually regenerate oxygen so you have to have oxygen neutral uh, technologies and nuclear is one of them whether it's tokamak fusion reactors pebble bed or thorium reactors and using buckyball filters and other systems we have to start realizing solar wind a wave turbine and nuclear safe nuclear has to be in our future because we can't keep on chewing up the world's oxygen it's not a good idea. Yeah, yeah, and I know we both share that opinion for sure. You know, yeah, you know, I don't hear other people who think that they're experts on it. Sorry, you're not an expert. I've seen both sides. And, yes, I'm scared to death by these nuclear reactors. Virtually every reactor in America needs to be delicensed. Any near fault line needs to be switched over to natural gas uh, or some other means like a natural gas turbine. Uh, they should never build nuclear reactors on fault lines. But there's lots of places where it can be done safely with newer designs where they have corium catchers, they have total safety and backup power systems, they are able to harden the reactor against extreme weather, etc. Uh, and they're, and to be honest with you, they're, they're done properly, it's extremely safe. But the problem is we've not done that. We haven't even over the past four decades developed a safe storage facility. They were talking about Yucca Mountain, but everybody says don't put it in my backyard. Well, the biggest problem is you can't put it in transport trailer trucks and put it on the freeways, especially if it's liquid radioactive waste which they tried to do from Rocky Flats. What they needed to right. do is turn into solid radioactive waste, put it in special rail cars, make sure it's on safe rail lines and not put it to extreme weather areas. Then you can safely transport it to a depot that will put it in the ground down seven or eight miles forever. Back in a moment. One of the things is that we don't have real leaders in the world anymore. It's obvious in Japan, here in America, the list of, of candidates we have for party here in the Republican Party. I'm hoping that we'll get some real leaders. Uh, I personally think that uh, Santorum and Ginrich would be probably the best leader uh, in the Republican Party. I think uh, um, that we need to have some realism in terms of the potential enemy of Islam. We need to have some realism in terms of the potential enemy of our own technology, like nuclear reactors. We also have to realize that abiotic uh, oil and gas is not our best friend. Yes, you can continue using it if you, as long as you have clean coal burning out of the technology. You're not putting out heavy metals, radioisotopes, uh, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and et cetera, and other toxins, which are destroying the biosphere and acidifying the oceans when you kill the biosphere. But the uh, issue is, what did we learn? I mean, what did we learn from Fukushima? What did we learn here in America? It seems just uh, peripherally, because I am uh, has an occupational doctor that worked uh, taking care of plants in Savannah, Georgia, uh, Savannah, Georgia uh, Savannah, South Carolina, just on the other side of the border that makes the advanced plutonium detonators. Uh, took care of a nuclear plant in central Illinois when I worked in Pekin, Illinois, as the occupant director there, and took uh, care of the employees working cleaning up the mess at Rocky Flats, that we basically fail in all these areas. 
and uh, it's almost like they're trying to fail, even though they've identified a lot of the issues here in America, and all we need is a recipe of bad uh, geotectonics or extreme weather or coronal mass ejection to knock out backup power, and we'd have more than one American of Fukushima here uh, in the next few years very easily. Uh, we had some very bad situations already, and some of these plants haven't come back online, like uh, the, um, uh, what was that plant? The Sequoia plant is still not back up, right? Uh, one of the Sequoia plants was not running, and one of them was that, uh, I don't know what the current status is. I know that the, bad, the severe weather took out all the power lines, save for a few of them, surrounding uh, one of the units at Sequoia, and by procedure, you reduce power in anticipation for the loss of those those power lines too so it's it's a safer condition you you you, you trip from a lower power because you're so what, anticipating yet yet the, if you're sitting in the electricity you might get a you might collapse the grid in other words yeah. you, so you so know, uh, let's say a hard uh, place on that one but so chris, if, i don't if know you're, you're, chris if you're sitting in a congressional committee and they're doing a grand jury investigation of what happened in Fukushima and what is the NRC doing to make sure that doesn't happen here in America because the normal in 2012 and beyond is not normal anymore. We have century and millennial events that happen almost monthly now. We have super quakes, we have super storms, we have decreases in magnetic field, we have now an increase in the bull shock wave of the gamma uh, background radiation rising rapidly. We have extreme solar storms like the ones that hit last week. We had two or three M8 and M9 class uh, solar storms that struck us with electron, proton, and plasma particles with direct hits that I'm sure knocked out communications and, and caused them to have to shut down satellites. And uh, some of these, if they just happen to be significant enough, they could really, you know, cripple our civilization. Plus, they have biological effects. They have effects on the ground levels of ultraviolet light, etc. We're not really prepared to deal with these extreme events anymore because we've not engineered these We've thought, ah, this can't happen in a hundred years or a thousand years, so we're not going to engineer for them. But that that logic doesn't hold anymore, does it? Uh, no, it doesn't. And we really discussed the big vulnerability and the necessity, both of a vulnerability and a necessity that power plants to keep them safe would be electricity. And you say, well, you know what? What are you talking about? The thing makes electricity. It should should have you know plenty of electricity, but it's not designed that way. Once once you lose the offsite power, you switch to backup power, and you take yourself away from uh, you take yourself off of the of the lost offsite power. And the problem is, well, especially at Fukushima, there was no backup power, and that's called the station blackout. And that's what we called we called that a year ago. We were right. That's that's what it was, and no plant could survive that for any length of time. And I'm talking about well, we, we used to think maybe four hours because you have four hours of battery. Uh, I'll tell you what, I've been through a lot of station blackout drills. Station blackout is a hectic scenario. At at a good day when there is no damage, when there's no damage from earthquakes, and and you can you have plenty of uh, opportunity to call in uh, offsite uh, uh, resources, it's still a nightmare. Uh, the, the control operator, we all, we all had to go through it you know, go and simulate the thing. It is a resource management nightmare. You have people that you've got to be sending out in the field. You've got to go ahead and conserve whatever battery power that you do have by stripping buses. In other words, going out with a checklist and taking uh, uh, flipping breakers open and the right ones so you don't do it the wrong way. And so you're trying to conserve battery power. And you're also doing other things like getting off-site resources on site. You have established cooling with a uh, with ways that uh, aren't typically performed as manual operation of valves that aren't really meant to be manually operated, or at least they don't, they seldomly get that way because they have motor operators on them or air operators, and now you're handling it by, by manual with a big hand wheel that, you know, it's on, it doesn't happen every day. Uh, we practice for it. And now can you imagine that in the dark? Can you imagine that with, with damage and rubble all around you? Can you imagine going through it with radio, uh, radiation fields building up? And, um, and there are broken pipes, so there's steam jets and heat and everything else. And by so, the way, the radiation uh, level is so high now that not, no human being, even if they're suicidal, could go in there and still be functional after a matter of minutes. The fact is that they're putting Yakuza, are putting in people that are non-trained technicians, in their minimum wages to pay off debts to the Yakuza in Japan, which is like the Japanese mafia. And these people are walking into a plant where they have no idea. They can just go in there, and after so many minutes, when they start to feel their brain turn to mush, uh, say a few word, curse words in Japanese before they know they're going to get so sick they'll soon expire. 
And that's the problem is we haven't used our yardstick, as I mentioned before, of imagination. We should be putting spider silk Kevlar tents over it, building corium catchers. You mentioned about last year the idea of taking containers and lining them with depleted uranium even to get people near those areas. The radiation right. levels are so high with gamma rays especially that penetrate through everything. You can stop al alpha particles with paper and so on, but you can't stop gamma unless you're using depleted uranium as a fairly thick layer uh, inside, say, a container and then snap them together like some kind of a Lego uh, toy set or one of these connects. If we don't start thinking out of the box in terms of robots that are connected by cables or radiation-resistant uh, microchips that probably exist in DARPA or Russian research or European research, we're never going to solve not only this problem but any extreme problem like this. And this, in fact, it could come out of the space program because you can guarantee that we've developed deep space investigation that would be in extreme conditions like this nuclear reactor where we operate in high radiation zones and deep space because deep space is very radioactive. It's a place where cosmic rays, gamma rays are regular, zeta particles can flash, fly, flash up microchips and destroy the, the bit rate of transfer of data. Uh, so this is really a, a challenge to us to say, are we going to apply imagination and science or are we going to sit here twiddling our thumbs while this disaster makes North America and the Northern Hemisphere as radioactive in 10 years as Northern Japan, where basically, this is my prediction, that within a few years it will become self-evident that with 4% of the children already admitted that they've been caused brain damage that were born in Fukushima in Northern Japan, that the women there will only deliver children after they submit their gametes to a birthing laboratory center to either have the fetus grown in an artificial uterus or reimplanted after they've excluded genetic anomalies. That's how bad this is. And we know that in America, at least 14 to 22,000 children under a year of age died because they don't have the enzymatic protection against even the radiation coming across the Pacific Ocean to North America, that the rate of death rose 38 to 42 percent in pediatric intensive care units. And no one in Japan is talking about this. I saw this display of these young women that are part of these college crew, and they're just standing there smiling, yes, we're Japanese, we're going to be patriotic, and they're going to go around and eat the food and and literally act like this, nothing's happened. It's just pure insanity. What, what do you think of this? What I think is that uh, we, can't, we, we can't afford to uh, leave this to chance because... Because one of the things that happened during Fukushima was that we did a study here also. It actually been ongoing study to see what our seismic conditions here in the United States are. Right. And we found that, uh, you know, it is likely that we'll have a, a, a large earthquake in areas that we didn't think that would, were susceptible to such. And now we really got to get serious about being able to handle such exactly. an event. Exactly. Exactly. We're not serious. We need to get serious right now. Back in a moment. said on the break, that's pretty shocking. Uh, FOIA documents against the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, what did they say exactly? How did I mute? Sorry. Uh, the, um, the FOIA documents are showing an, a, uh, an interaction between uh, some members, uh, I'm going to say, of the national labs and uh, the NRC. Uh, they, they didn't want the labs involved because it, it would... It, it, they were to talk media. It's I, inflammatory. I, 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 Who wants the truth out? Not the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They don't want to test air, food, and water. In fact, even UC Berkeley even used the wrong standards uh, to determine the number of picocuries of radioiodine, and they were out by a factor of 27 times. Oh, wow. So it's actually 27 times more radioactive radiation coming to North America in rain or in vapor along the coast. And most people aren't aware of another thing called radioactive buckyballs that carry, each buckyball can carry up to 20, up to 64 plutonium atoms, the average size buckyball. Uh, people aren't aware of the uranium, the uranium oxide, UO uh, oxide that is present, that comes in, so uranium or plutonium. And these other isotopes, some of them have incredibly long half-lives. Plutonium, of course, is 24,900 years. 
And uh, see, as, as we know, if you inhale one years. atom of plutonium and you get it in your lungs, it will right. eventually kill you. Yeah, and uh, just the cesium and strontium, we're talking about hundreds of years. So if you take four half-lives, you're talking about somewhere around a thousand years for it to drop to a reasonable level. This is not rational. And so we get these kind of lies. It's like, what's the purpose? Well, I mentioned the purpose on Jeff Rents on Tuesday evening in the second hour. Their purpose is they want to get rid of wild reproduction. They want people either sterile or having so many birth defected babies. They'll only submit their gametes to a laboratory so the state takes over reproduction. People say, oh, no, Dr. Deagle, they wouldn't do that. Well, the Japanese have already had a plunging birth rate. What better solution than to have laboratories generating the next generation of healthy, young, super Japanese, maybe even genetically enhanced? So, you know, who knows what they're planning on doing? Playing God is a script for a nightmare. Well, I see it happening, and I, I, I get very suspicious when I see absolutely no action. Like, even if you're, as they say, even if you're screwing up, at least you're trying. But I don't even see screw-ups happening. I see nothing. The, uh, the thing that uh, uh, Chris sent us here, I'm looking at it, and uh, uh, it says, call lab directors and say, knock it off. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, Chris, no, just summarize up about it. <laughs> Chris, tell us how bad it is. And what are the other highlights of this news report? Because we want to get this in before we close today. Because this is, in a sense, the pre-anniversary this Sunday of the Fukushima disaster. And it's not over. This is not like the Chernobyl that was one big, you know, uh, graphite explosion and it was one pulse of radiation. This is increasing. In fact, the number of terabacarals of radiation is increased in January over even November, December. And if the Mox 4 cooling pool falls over and goes critical, we're talking about 100 times more radiation being released than even the initial problems that occurred with the earthquake alone and then the tsunami. This is going to get worse and worse and worse before it gets even more catastrophic. Well, I can't, I can't agree with that more. I mean, it is basically a, a uh, waste generation facility with no off switch. I mean, it is the ultimate dirty bomb, so, you know, that's how that... You know that's how that how that works. So there's a lot of information to keep covering. You know, if if we were, but in closing, I guess I would say that uh, there was one report from from one uh, 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 a group of uh, experts who said that had the uh, Fukushima guys have uh, followed all the all the practices, the best practices and standards, they would have probably. M- probably been able to combat this and we talked about having the right equipment available and the right training and they were unwilling to do that over in Japan and, and there, there are some consequences you know it's hard to it's hard to say well what if they had you know everything and then if the if the, uh, the because they also had a you know tsunami and the earthquake it's it's a it's a pretty uh, uh, unbelievable uh, one-two punch that uh, nature could provide it however it, it it does there are some people that that do believe that they did have all the additional uh, severe accident mitigation equipment that that are pretty much found in all of the power plants in the United States, plus the extras that we're going to come up with, uh, they may have prevented the meltdowns. And that's, you know, that's, and that's a report. And that, that would be the, uh, I sent that to you all. Well, they didn't, they didn't build the seawall anywhere near high enough. And, it, you know, it, uh, it, it shouldn't come as a shock. Uh, to the Japanese people of all people on Earth, that uh, there are earthquakes and earthquakes cause tidal waves, tsunamis, because they are the most earthquake-prone nation on Earth. Right. Exactly. And, In other uh, words, I mean, they, they well, built uh, but, a, a bunch of these uh, uh, right together, right on the ocean, no, and within a few miles, there were several additional plants, and they were at one point very concerned that they were going to have a domino effect. Well, they do have one. And this is the other thing that's come out today, a year later now, and this is from reports in Japan that the Miyagi reactors, the Omiyagi reactor, all these other ones, uh, in many prefectures all over northern Japan are broken. In fact, there's only five out of 55 reactor sites that are still operational. A lot of these reactors, including on the other side of the island that weren't anywhere near this tsunami, were damaged to the point where they're now turned off. And people don't realize you don't just well, turn off still a nuclear reactor. A giant atomic bombs sitting right. there. Sitting at, well, basically nuclear waste sites that are very unstable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nuclear, unstable nuclear waste sites. Uh, Chris, you, I think you summed it up perfect. Uh, you, what did you call it? The, uh, the, 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 uh, the perfect 
a dirty bomb that keeps on keeps on giving keeps on yeah. giving doesn't end so, yeah, well it, ho hopefully maybe one day we'll figure out how to c contain it all I, I don't know uh, any other way to do that but uh, right now all the efforts are treated otherwise well, we're here in America what's going on here because we have now two reactors they're building in Georgia they have a plan to build 25 in America they say they're somewhat safer because they they don't go into hot shutdown. We know the hot shutdown caused by the domino effects here in Yuma, Arizona, where somebody played a few keystrokes, caused the plant to literally burn out two, uh, $2 billion total cost turbines <coughs> in San Onofre. No, I'm not choking on radiation. Plants <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, here in San Onofre, we have all kinds of reactors, like you mentioned. Let's go to the ones here in America, Byron. What's happening there? What's happening at the one in Oklahoma? What's happening at the ones in in, uh, in North, North Carolina, the uh, North Annan reactor? Well, okay, I guess the one that's most significant currently is that we have we had some severe weather back on March fourth, and uh, tornadoes, and it did disable a lot of the power lines around uh, the Sequoia plant. Now, Sequoia, right. one of the we watching that, and where is the Sequoia plant? Uh, a Tennessee plant. And that plant we talked about since what was that last uh, June and July we were in, talking about that. We were, yeah, we were, we, yes, we were talking about that. So I guess we're in ba back in tornado season. One of the one of the units was already offline, but the other one had to decrease power down to eighty percent. So that in the anticipation for a loss of the power, it would uh, lose. Um, it, it wouldn't. Uh, my, uh, it wouldn't. Um, uh, affect it, it, it could it could it could uh, reduce power and and come offline in the anticipation for the loss of the other. <laughs> um, we, we, in other words, offline means the thing could could damage equipment, lose containment, and even release, release radiation and tritium into the local area. What you do is you reduce power so that you could anticipate the loss of the of the remaining power lines in the area because it's a lot better to go ahead and trip from a lower power than a higher power. So you do that. Uh, by procedure, it's a procedure that we, that we follow. Yeah. So uh, that's what's happening right now in Sequoia because uh, you know they did lose some power lines. There's a lot of damage down there, and uh, that's pretty much current what's what's going on now. The other parts, the other problems that we had is some switchyard problems where some breakers in several different plants. Wolf Creek was down for a really long time. It still is, and they're just finding out a lot of problems in that plant. Also. Um, so this policy, course, by the way, those, uh, possibly caused by uh, some by hacking terrorism. You know, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer. So, to so, that. so the bottom line is, Obama's policy is to build nuclear plants without proper safety, not properly shut down or replace technology. Of now, seventy-five percent of the plants are on near fault lines in America. If they're going to replace them with natural gas, which is what I recommend, and build no plants near extreme weather areas below the high tide line uh, and if you're going to build nuclear reactors they have to be fusion type reactors tokamak or safe ones that don't go into hot shutdown and vent off radioisotopes yes we do need nuclear in the future but we need to be a lot more careful than we are and they need to listen to experts like you chris harris closing comments of on the anniversary of fukushima fukushima we got a long way to go we're spiraling down the open maw of a radioactive volcano called Fukushima, and the whole world is having the effects of World War III every day now.